So uh, I'm going to welcome our presenters now. Uh, we have uh, three presenters in person. Uh, the topic this morning is what to do to avoid, prepare, and deal with disasters. Uh, so uh, the first pre pre presenter I'm going to introduce is Ron Enns. Ron was asked to join the City of Vancouver's heavy urban search and rescue team, Canada Task Force One in 2005. He began a long training regime that included confined space rescue, rope rescue, trench rescue, structural collapse rescue, and incident command. Ron completed his Manitoba Emergency Service College Rescue Instruction Certification in 2012 at Texas A&M University in 2013 and was seconded to the Justice Institute of BC for four months to help develop the trench rescue and structural collapse courses. Ron received a HUSAR unit citation from the City of Vancouver's Fire Chief in 2014 for his exemplary service as a member of Canada Task Force One with the rescue mission at Johnson Landing. Our next presenter, who is also in person, is uh, Valerie Jenkinson. She's one of the founders and chair of Operator, Operators Without Borders and has led teams on water utility recovery post-disaster. She is part of the WASH group and holds certific certificates in disaster coordination. Last year, she was named the focal point of the year for Global Water Partners Caribbean in recognition of her contributions to the water industry in the Caribbean. Valerie is CEO of World Water and Waste Solutions Limited and has worked with national and local governments, the EOCP, the Ministry of Health and Waste Management Association of BC, primarily undertaking stakeholder consultations and writing strategic and communication planning documents. Valerie has also presented on integrated water resource management around, around the world, including the UK, the USA, Africa, Singapore, the Philippines, and Malaysia. She's also taught for 25 years at the BC Institute of Technology and the School of Business, and has also taught at the University of British Columbia. Uh, we have a third person who is actually remote, um, joining our panel this morning. Ian McKellawam is the current chair of Canada's National Critical Infrastructure Working Group and the Canadian Mirror Committee for ISO TC224, which developed the international standards on crisis management of water. He has been instrumental in developing public works emergency and continuing programs in his position as manager, compliance of the Regional Ministry of Durham. He's currently leading the response to the COVID-19 for the Durham Water and Wastewater Region, as emergency declaration was made in March 17, 2020. He's also current chair of the Security Emergency Management Committee of the Caribbean Water and Wastewater Association, which operates with Public Safety Canada and other federal departments' concerns with emergency preparedness. So welcome, Ian. And our fourth participant, who's here in person, um, is Greg Selec Selecki. Uh, Greg was instrumental in the development of Canada's national critical infrastructure framework as the water sector represent when he advised the um, Canada pandemic plan. Greg also has experience managing three of the largest floods in Alberta's history, as well as maintaining the role of EOC manager for hundreds of activations while providing leadership to municipalities during six states of local emergency. So welcome to uh, all three of you to the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning to Ian in the wilds of Alberta. Um, glad you could join us. So today this is going to uh, be thanks, Val. <laughs> this will be a little bit different because we're not going to be doing PowerPoint presentations. We're going to be having a panel discussion around the expertise around this floor mm. around disasters, and I'm mostly going to be moderating that. I've done a lot of work with emergency response plans. And I've written a lot of emergency response plans in my time for uh, utilities, mostly in the Caribbean, but some in here. And after I started working in disasters, I realized that the disaster plans I had written were not nearly robust enough. So it's been a learning curve for me as I've been able to bring myself up more to speed. And it's an honor to work with both Ron and Greg and Ian, who all volunteer with Operators Without Borders, as well as their daytime jobs. So the first question I'm going to ask for each of you, um, what was your biggest surprise when you responded to your first disaster? 
And perhaps uh, in Ian's case, that might be the pandemic. It might be elsewhere. So, Ron, your, f your biggest surprise when you first hit your first disaster. Ah, well, thanks, Valerie. And uh, great, I'm first one up. Okay. Um, so my, my response actually uh, was the Johnson Landing landslide, Cosmo BC. Um, and uh, probably the biggest surprise we found is the uh, communication issue. And that's something I'll probably elaborate a little bit more uh, later on. Uh, most of the stuff we can kind of uh, um, uh, prepare for to some degree. Um, but like Valerie was mentioning too, is, is your first response you learn uh, and you take those lessons learned and you apply that to the next uh, disaster. We found the biggest thing that really surprised us all was the communication over longer periods that we didn't have interrupter, we didn't have the proper radio systems, it didn't go long enough. There was so many different factors and without communication, being one of the number one essential needs of any type of disaster response, it really, uh, it really crippled us very, very quickly, but we managed to get it up and running with the help of forestry. Um, but uh, that's, that's a, a different conversation. <laughs> okay. Greg. Yeah, well, I'm gonna have to echo that quite a bit. For me, it was uh, 2005, the Southern Alberta floods. And at that time, it was shortly after 9-11 in 2001. And one of the things that actually changed my path was moving from a firefighter into emergency management and business continuity was the fact that so many emergency responders died in New York at that time. And one of the reasons they found was the lack of communication. Uh, for me, it's the communication and coordination aspect of, of responding to that first flood in 2005 for me. It was looking like, it, it seemed like most areas were working in silos and not sharing the information that they had. So that ultimately uh, reduces your ability to coordinate a, a, a much uh, better response. And uh, as I've moved forward, I think it's the incident management systems uh, that inherently have a communication system uh, within, uh, within its own structure, as well as decision-making models, uh, having a goal in place. As Adam talked about, we all need goals. What are those goal goals during crisis? So it, it's really looking at that coordination and communication aspect as well. Okay. Ian. Uh, I think for me, really, it was the uh, two events. One was the North American blackout. And uh, that was quite an event and uh, experienced by a lot of people. But what that really kind of opened my eyes to is we had a lot of plans uh, and we thought we were good. Uh, for example, we certainly had fuel delivery plans and that they had to have backup measures. But what we didn't have was a contract with our fuel supplier that they had to have backup power. So it turns out they had all the fuel in the world, all the diesel, but they couldn't load their own trucks to deliver it to us. So we ended up having to go out and uh, maintain about 100 generators at, at, for backup power at uh, wastewater pumping stations and well sites uh, just in the backs of trucks. And also our communications went down. Uh, certain towers went down during that event. For us, uh, we used to have the old mic phones, uh, so they weren't any use to us in calling in our, our backup operational personnel. And then the second event uh, is uh, Durham Region actually had uh, one of the very few uh, explosions at a digester system. Uh, it was on a sludge blend tank. Uh, fortunately, there was no one injured. Uh, it did blow the roof off the tank uh, that, due to a methane buildup. Uh, extensive damage, about $6 million worth. But for me, it was just that experience of, you know, the control and command of it. And, you know, it's our site. It was our incident. We're in there trying to fix it uh, and make sure everybody's safe. But, but really, there's a command structure in place. So the fire marshal came, over, came in, took over several days. The Ministry of Labor took over the site for several days, even though there was a critical injury. And it's just getting used to that, that uh, when you do respond to emergencies, to have met the people in advance, to know the communications, know the hierarchy, and know where you fit in so that you can do the best job under the situation. Thanks, Val. Okay, so each of you have mentioned communication. So what's the secret to the good communication? Beck, maybe start with you. Yeah, it really is, I think, understanding that, that structure that you'll have in place, but the, the most important point would be to uh, practice and uh, see what that's going to be like. And, and what we really uh, fail to do in emergency management is practice to that point of failure, meaning, uh, sure, we'll have a nice exercise in place. We want to validate the plans that we've written and 
um, uh, have, have practiced in the past, but there's a certain point where um, things aren't always going to go right and they're never going to go according to the plan that you have in place. So when you do exercise and when you do the practice, uh, practice not having batteries, practice uh, having miscommunication. Uh, throw that into your exercise just to see what happens and, and how you manage that and get into the process of identifying um, certain aspects of your response so that you can catch that information and share the information. Ron? Yeah. Oh, um, yeah, actually, just to elaborate on Greg, exactly that. Um, uh, not only practice, and, and, and I've, I've seen so many failures where they'll go out, they'll, they'll practice, we'll do an exercise, um, everybody congratulates themselves on a fantastic, we had no problems, everything went great, and then they forget about it. And then when a real disaster comes along, suddenly there's all these things they did not think about. Um, so one of the biggest things, and just like Greg said, is, is, is go out there, practice, and, and practice failures. And, and what are we going to do? What's your plan B and C? Everybody has a great plan A. I've seen tons of great plan A's, but nobody has a very good B or a terrible C. And we always have a backup. What, if that doesn't work, what's our backup? If this doesn't work, what's our backup? Um, and without communication, you don't have an effective rescue. You have effective nothing. You know, you just have, a, 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 it just, it, it turns into a disaster in its own, um, if that makes any sense. Um, but uh, definitely um, practice the failures as well. Practice your B and C plan. Make sure you have a backup to your backup. So you talked about when something goes wrong. What type of things did you see go wrong that needed to be addressing that you hadn't planned for? Oh. Uh, <laughs> I don't even know where to start. Um, I can throw it, one in there. You, I, I yeah. know when, um, uh, well, actually during the second uh, Southern Alberta floods in 2013, oh. which were uh, five times as bad as, as the first year, uh, and involved both rivers at that time, something as that sounds as simple as having a re-entry plan for all of the uh, communities that were evacuated. So at that time, that was one of the largest evacuations in Canadian history, about 85,000 people that had to be moved out of the river valley, uh, bringing them back in. So um, y y by that time, we had time to develop our plans for reentry. Uh, we had a good method of uh, um, planning and, and situation reports ongoing, and the planning process was, was pretty uh, well-rounded and, and, and giving us some good information. And uh, we were working with the gas company, the electric company, uh, safety codes uh, inspectors to get them uh, people back into their homes. They needed electricity. Uh, great, so you put that into the uh, leadership of the electric company and they still wanna work with the safety codes officers and so on and so forth to make sure uh, the homes are available. Start by community and community. Uh, finish the day and the plan is in place and it's like, okay, we have electricity to this whole community. Great, start sending the people in. Pretty soon, you get phone calls coming back saying, I don't have any electricity, there's no electricity in our home. Well, electricity meant to the electric company that it was up to all the homes on the road. It doesn't mean it's in the house. Like, mm -hmm. all of us would think we turn on the lights and there you go, I have electricity. So even that, it, we're all in the same room, we're all talking about everything. We're all pretty clear on what we're saying, but it still meant something different to the electric company. That was just one of many things that uh, get miscommunicated. Yeah. So one of the things there that I hear is the need in basic communication of clarification that we're all on the same page. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Ian, can you add from that? Yeah, I, I heard uh, both Ron and uh, Greg talking about communications in your earlier question. And I, I think probably all three of us have said it over the years is uh, an emergency operations center is no place to be exchanging business cards. Uh, and you really do have to practice and uh, you have to practice with the people and also the backups because when something goes extended, like some of the ones Greg's been in with the floods where, you know, you're not talking hours, you're talking weeks of uh, maintaining an emergency operations center backup people, you really do have to meet those people and establish your communication lines and how you're going to do them, uh, not only within that room, but out in the field. And, um, just to follow up on communications and asking what can go wrong, I had uh, briefly discussed uh, uh, the North American power outage where we found out some of our phones weren't working because one of the towers didn't, cell towers didn't have backup power. Um, so we did look at, uh, we got a brand new radio system. Um, I won't say the brand name, but we got it for all departments within the region. So that would be our fire, or sorry, our uh, regional fire, our police, our paramedics, ourselves, and water and wastewater. Uh, 
One of the things we kind of forgot, though, because we thought, okay, great, we can talk among ourselves and with the municipalities. Well, in Durham Region is uh, a large number of nuclear reactors, probably the most in any municipality in Canada. So they're quite tied into our emergency preparedness. Well, they were using a different phone system. So we still couldn't communicate with them. So we had to purchase them phones as, too, as well. So a lot of the times you think you're covered, but you really need to take during exercises a red team approach where you purposely try to fail things or purposely look at what could go wrong. And hopefully you'll find those items like us not being able to communicate uh, with the folks over at uh, Ontario Power Generation and things like that earlier than when the event happened. Okay. So in Durham, uh, what type of practices do you do? We've talked. Ah, seem to have lost the yeah. sound. Okay. No. Uh, can you hear me still? Yeah, can now. Yeah. Okay, great. And uh, please just let me know if the sound's bad because, I, like I said, I am camping and I don't want to hold up the, uh, the show here with my bad quality. I can always drop out and try it again. Um, in Durham, uh, in Durham, because we are a municipality and uh, in Ontario, you do have to exercise under the Emergency Management Act, uh, Civil Protection Emergency Management Act. Uh, for COVID, they have uh, relieved that response for 2020. Uh, so we do conduct a very large regional exercise. And then at our water and wastewater plants, uh, we're always conducting exercises, whether it's a chlorine evacuation, a uh, chemical spill, a large water main break, a security issue. Um, you really do uh, have to make it part of your routine to conduct these exercises. And, and that can be a wide variety. It can be a tabletop exercise. It can just be a tailgate discussion, or it can be a full-out exercise in the field. And uh, also, too, is uh, you really do have to, when you have an event, uh, Take a look at that and measure it against what the expected outcomes from your emergency plans are, and you can use that as an exercise. An exercise doesn't have to be something made up and set aside and everybody worn for a day. Um, an exercise can be an event that has occurred. If you do the follow-up and check where our actions, what we expected, and if not, you correct those procedures. Thanks. Oh, you've cut a little bit. I, I, I remember um, when I was dealing with a utility in Ontario and they had a new manager and the new manager made them do chlorine leak practices week after week after week. And uh, they were getting fed up of doing these practices. You know, why have we got to do this? We know what we're doing. Practice. And then they had a chlorine leak. The manager was away. She came back in during this situation with the chlorine leak. And she said it was just amazing because everybody was in their place. Everybody knew exactly what to do. She said they were so relaxed with this that they're actually talking about the hockey game the night before. <laughs> so that's, I think, what we're talking about is, you know, not just a one-off practice, but it's got to be ingrained. So, Ron, in, in your experience, you know, do we do enough practices? What should they look like? Um, yeah, that's uh, some good points. And... Uh... And uh, honestly, uh, every, every plan I've seen and, and ones that we work with, plus, plus what we've uh, looked at other uh, disasters that are very closely related to what would happen in our own province, um, we found that, that there wasn't enough practice. Uh, there certainly wasn't. And, and like we elaborated before, is there was no plan B or C and not, not a very good one at that. Um, and, and there's two types of practices. And, and uh, Ian mentioned uh, one of them that I was going to mention as well is you know, we, we got the practical exercise uh, that we can practice, and we also have the tabletop exercise. Tabletop exercise is just bringing all the decision makers together in a room, in a big round table, and then pretending a natural disaster existing, and then just going through the steps, and then having other people put their opinions forward and saying, well, if that's going to happen, then, you know, our response would be this. And a lot of times it opens the doors, you don't realize, wow, I didn't think of that, or I didn't think of this. So we always tried to go to our tabletop exercises first, then do our practical exercises, and it gave us a much better idea of what to expect. Okay. Greg, you talked about two things in your first disaster. One was the communications, and the other was the command. So do you want to talk a little bit about that, and how do you bring all these people together and get them working on the same page? Yeah, it, it, was, it was about the coordination and the incident management systems that are available and out there uh, routinely come with their own type of decision-making models. And, uh, that's what's really important, I think, to practice is how we're going to work together as a team. 
and, and get to that goal. Ultimately, we want to save lives, protect property and the environment, uh, and still have uh, an idea about the financial implications of, of what's occurring. So uh, no one person has all that information in a municipality or in a corporation. And that's why you have the team together, whether it's physically, and I know I've been through so many EOC activations, and now with COVID, it's in a virtual EOC activation, but you still need um, the same type of people with the same type of processes ongoing. It doesn't matter whether we're all together, whether we're virtual, whether we have the best incident management software on our computers and laptops. Uh, what's the process? Whether we have to use whiteboards and a, uh, and a pen uh, because the, now the technology isn't working uh, as opposed to having the, the, the software. So uh, getting to that point where we have that whole decision-making model in place and having those experts all together understanding our objectives, our strategies, then we can get to those tactics. Um, th that's what's important, I think, is having that coordination. Then we're all moving in the same direction. We still might waver every once in a while, but at least we're all moving in the same direction instead of having people mm -hmm. self-respond or thinking they're doing a good thing by um, responding in some way or the other, or even, again, miscommunicating in some way or the other. Right. So most of you have mentioned COVID. COVID is, is with us. So. Tell me about what you see with COVID right now in this industry and how are we dealing with it? Ian, you're in charge of the Durham response and the regional response. Um, if each of you could just talk a little bit about how you're adapting in this COVID situation. Ian, do you want to start yeah, off? Val. Uh, yeah, Val, I will. Uh, thanks. Um, good question. Um, with COVID and the water and wastewater sector, um, nothing has really changed and and that's one of the biggest things we're up against the initial threat and the threat that continues to today is the chance of having someone in a water or wastewater plant an operator infected and infect others in that uh and the big issue is we can't just swap out people like uh, you know a large office might be able to do where you know if your janitorial staff got sick you would just get replacements in or a security guard it's uh, operators are licensed professionals and they're very good at their jobs and we can't simply uh, swap people in for them. So if a sickness gets in there, whether it's COVID or another illness, that's really our greatest fear and our greatest risk right now. And that really hasn't changed. Um, the probability has dropped in certain areas and gone up again in certain areas of community spread, but it's still, once it gets into a plant, it's going to be very tricky. And luckily across Canada, and even for that matter, a lot through the states, is we haven't seen a lot of spread within the actual plants. Uh, those water utilities that have had it have had more in the office types, the design team, the engineers, water billing, things like that, where the people can telework if they do get it, uh, COVID or another illness, where really, if you're a frontline staff, an essential worker like a water or wastewater worker that's not an option so that's uh, really been the key focus and then the measures to combat that is obviously physical distancing or you know as a last resort ppe masks uh, other appropriate gear uh, so the water sector really has uh, looked at measures like that like staggered shifts uh, people working from alternate locations the use of technology such as SCADA operate equipment from home but uh, that's the mode we're going to be in until there is a, a widely uptake uh, vaccine, I think. Uh, maybe Greg and uh, Ron can uh, say a little more on that. Yeah, before, before I go away from you, uh, one of the things is you've got crews in the distribution and the collection network. How are you dealing with the crews out there who are usually two, three, maybe four to a truck? That was a remarkably big issue at the start. Um, Initially, what we did was uh, you, you only have so many trucks. So you can't, to go to one staff member per truck in a larger municipality, it was difficult. So we ended up splitting shifts, uh, running a day shift and an afternoon shift. Uh, we did collapse those this time of year. Once you hit August, typically vacations are quite prevalent. And we just didn't have the ability to, you know, get the entire crew each time, the different skill sets we need. Um, we now use masks. Uh, where it's mandatory that any person in a vehicle was, must wear a mask. And uh, that's really policed by the public. Um, 
when you pull up in, I don't know, whichever municipality you're in, usually your trucks are very identifiable. And people, especially because they're home during COVID, they take a great interest on what you're doing on their front lawn. So they are all over our crews, unfortunately, to the point where they feel a bit watched, really. Because if they show up without a mask or if they're working and they are working six feet apart and not wearing one, uh, we will get calls in about them all the time. Thank you. Okay. Ron, over to you. You, you do, obviously, at the university doing water, water and wastewater operator training. How have you adapted? Um, yeah, so mine's not quite as, as elaborate as Ian's. I liked, I liked his discussion on this. Um, being the educational institution, um, we're a bit higher profile. Um, we, we have to follow the Ministry of Health and Advanced Ed's protocols. Um, and, and it's changed a lot. I mean, most of it's going to be going online now. Um, I mean, that's just reality of it uh, as much as possible, but we still have to do our hands-on practical. And, and that's been a challenge at the university. Um, it's not a, a perfect system. It's still being worked on. It's still relatively new. Um, we really haven't gone, uh, like our phase three, you know, going into this, the hands-on uh, portion or the practical portion of the university is still relatively new. Um, so there's a lot of lessons still be learned. Um, so there's not much really I can, I can discuss other than that because it's still such a big learning curve right now. And we don't like it so much COVID protocols, more as I call it a pandemic protocol, because COVID may disappear. We may have another SARS-3, who knows? So. so let's go to the man who's dealt with many pandemics. You've dealt with <laughs> SARS, you've dealt with H1N1, H5N1. So what are some of the lessons you've learned and what's going to happen? What's, what's your feeling? Yeah, you talk I'm, about a second wave. I'm glad Ron uh, mentioned it's, it's not really COVID uh, planning anymore. It, it's, it's pandemic planning and I, I spent a good half of my career uh, developing pandemic plans federally, provincially, uh, for municipalities and different, and now for different corporations. Um, it's it's it, it's here. I, I mean, it, it, we have to be able to work within the parameters of of what the experts are telling us. Um, we're going to, you know, we, we've we're, you've heard flattening the curve since March. Um, uh, I, I was presenting on this in, in February as well as with uh, one of uh, uh, my acquaintances from, from FEMA at the time. And uh, then by, by the time March hit, uh, uh, we really got uh, a, a good visual of what was going to happen. So the, the, the groups, uh, meaning uh, entities, whether again, there were companies, uh, government that understood business continuity planning and really took that to heart as far as a leadership initiative, I think we have seen have fared much better. Uh, the things that we learned from SARS and H1N1 as a country um, filtered down uh, in, in some aspects to the municipalities and the hospitals and the health sector. Uh, in turn, you have all the other different critical infrastructure sectors that are related to that, that if they were looking at the business continuity planning and specifically pandemic planning, they likely have fared better. Uh, so now with these new protocols, I mean, now we're much better at having gels in front of us, wearing our masks, wearing gloves maybe, social distancing like we should, because that's what we're being told. This isn't going to change. And it's not just COVID, it's the next one. Um, people ask me all the time, so yeah, you know, you, you did this for 15 years and you planned for this. Did you really think it was gonna happen? Yeah, and it's gonna happen again. And there's gonna be a flood again and a plane crash again and a, uh, an earthquake. Is it gonna happen in 10 years, one year, 100 years in Vancouver? So we have to consider that and plan for that and at least practice in those, in those different aspects. But now, as far as our workplace goes, um, this is what it is. It's not going to change anytime soon. So what can we expect in the coming months, years, perhaps, with COVID? Yeah, and, and that, you know, really can't tell too much about it. I'll have actually a, a graphic tomorrow on where we are right now with COVID as far as mortality and infectiousness is concerned related to some of the other diseases we're used to seeing and having around. Uh, the flu, we've normalized in society that there's going to be 3,000 die a year uh, in Canada. Well, we've had 10,000 right now in, in Canada die from COVID. Um, we have to start working within those parameters. Uh, we won't know until we're out of it how, how bad and what the effect was of COVID on all of this, but I don't think it'll be anytime soon. We keep hearing from experts, the second wave is coming. Um, uh, different infectious rates are, are, are already uh, on the rise in Alberta, BC and Ontario. 
we, we've been told that for months and now it's happening. So uh, what are we doing as a business, as a municipality, as a, the water sector to work within that? Um, uh, hopefully everyone's been planning a bit more because listening to our es experts is, is what we need to do. And it, like I say, it's going to be a while before we understand the total impact of this, but we do need to keep moving forward right now. So what lessons did we learn from the past pandemics? Um, SARS, one of the big things was our communication flow actually. And uh, in Canada, we're pretty lucky because uh, of the way our healthcare system is set up, right from uh, the federal agencies to the provincial agencies to the hospitals. We learned to share that communication much more broadly. In H1N1, we learned that there was a supply chain issue, meaning we ran out of masks, uh, back, we being the world. Uh, back then as well, 3M ran out of masks at that time. Uh, we ran out of isogel. We ran out of uh, uh, rubber gloves. And uh, so that was a big eye opener. And some corporations, some government agencies took that to heart. Uh, a good example is Alberta being able to share a lot of their supplies with the eastern provinces because there was such a stockpile. And once they were able to see uh, what was in, how Alberta was handling the impact, they could share that. So first it was the communication, then it was the supply chain issues. And uh, I think you've seen, I mean, every morning we still get our medical officers of health telling us what's going on in each province. So the communication is there. Hospitals are sharing information and supplies if need be, and we will fare better uh, than a lot of countries because of that. Terrific. Ron, going forward, what do you see as going to be a new norm uh, you know, from your point of view? Um, well, I'll probably focus most on the educational sector. Is yeah. It's going to be exactly that, the new norm. Uh, new norm basically means is that you know, moving forward, what we're seeing being, being installed and, and put in place is going to be very is going to be continuous um, you know many of the experts have said that this is not over not for another year maybe two um, so after a year or two of doing you know going through the motions of you know social distancing using the mask you know you know uh, washing your hands on a regular basis um, it's just going to become the new norm that's just going to become you know we'll be going you know don't you remember way back in the day you know back in you know 2019 where we used to uh, go to the beach parties and they used to you know 100 of us all crowded into a 10 by 10 section or the mosh pits or you know and, and this is just going to be stories we're going to tell our kids because it's just not going to be reality anymore um, so and, and I think if everyone kind of understands that and and slowly kind of gets into the motions of, of understanding that pandemics are going to be here to stay and it's just going to be continuous I mean you know like you mentioned you know Mar there was uh, there's SARS 1 or SARS 2 um, there was there was pandemic going back in the early 1900s that most people, you know, really didn't, you know, at that time they were wearing they were wearing face masks and doing everything else. And this we're talking early 1900s, you know, back in the plagues, uh, you know, days of I can't remember this, uh, what flu was, Spanish. 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 That's what it was. Yeah. yeah, you know that, that was, and now here we are repeating it. They're showing black and white photos, uh, you know, of of what it looked like back then. And I'm going, hey, that's today. <laughs> so. We really got to get into the motions of, of understanding this, not just just individually wise, um, but also companies, corporations, and and see that this is this is a pandemic that's going to stay. This is going to be something that we're going to continually seeing. Our population is getting bigger. It's getting more crowded. It's not getting smaller. We're not going to have more open spaces. We're going to have less open spaces. So we can't ignore this. It, it's got to. It, it's really we really got to do something to move forward with it. So we we look, Greg, at the fact that. We really don't know what's going to happen. We don't know how this virus is going to go. But based on if you look at the Spanish flu, it wasn't year one that killed people, was it? No. It, uh, I think it, it, it circled the world three times. So you hear a lot about the three pandemic waves. Um, we're, we, and we don't know again exactly where we are, but the second wave is probably coming in the fall. I think 500 million people were infected in the Spanish flu over a period of three years, uh, and 50 million died. Well, we're in year one of, of, of COVID here. And although we've uh, advanced uh, significantly with technology and as a species, it doesn't matter to a virus, right? Uh, how much technology we have now, we're just able to be well, much more well informed. So um, yeah, and, and the, the good thing is we will be able to uh, implement, uh, again, a lot of the things that we learned from 1918 and from some of these other uh, recent pandemics of the last century where 
social distancing matters, masks matter, uh, not gathering close, uh, that all matters. So um, it, it's, I think, the, the, the past that we've uh, learned from and uh, where we're going to have to keep moving forward just to, it, it's a wake up for everybody and uh, to, to ensure that we've got a uh, good continuity of, of business in, in the water sector and other sectors, and we're gonna have to adhere to some of these learnings. So we hear about COVID fatigue, and Ron, you're dealing in the university with lots of young people. Um, we see in the States and Eastern Canada, you know, young people getting together, and the spread right now is coming from the ages 18 to 44, I understand. Um, so how is the university trying to enforce some of these measures? Oh, boy. Um, uh, enforcement's been a tough one. I mean, we're not, you know, uh, it's, you know, being Canadians and, and, and from BC, we're not, we really don't like to push enforcement. That's not just something that we do even from a government's perspective or from, you know, we got to have more gentle ways of doing it. And, you know, usually it's an explanation, understanding, um, you know, and, and how it spreads and, and getting a good, if, if the student has a good understanding of, of how it spreads, what it can do, and you know, kind of not not um, not going by what the the uh, media has said or, or what you know what you see in different social media aspects, because a lot of that stuff isn't necessarily true. Um, and and taught the proper way, you, you find them that they're very understanding, and that and that they will you know once they understand why, and it, it's so much easier to implement if that makes any sense, and they and they start doing that. But again, we're still at the beginning stages of that, so. You know, we won't really see the effects like, you know, like you were saying, Greg, is, is not for, you know, six months, a year, two years down the road. We're going to look back and say, okay, what, what could have we done better? And, yeah, and that's, that's really the key part is, you know, this is what happened. How can we make this better next time around? Okay. Ian, um, do you feel the threat of COVID-19 has diminished the water sector in any way? Um, yeah, it, it actually may have, Valerie. It's The water sector's quite interesting for COVID in the sense that, you know, we never stopped. Um, you know, the water kept coming and the sewage kept going, basically. But a lot of the talk and focus is on reopening, you know, places that shut down completely or have opened up again, but with limited services. And, and water and wastewater, you know, we didn't have that luxury. Uh, our staff had to go to work every day. And I think uh, in hearing, too, that you know, some of the unionized staff and the frontline operators, you know, it gets them a little bit because, you know, they're there working every day hard. And a lot, so much talk is about office-style jobs and returning to work. And overall in the water sector, it didn't impact us that much except the physical distancing and the PPE. But some of the things that are come out of that, though, are, is unfortunately uh, we have really locked down our water plants again. Uh, so, you know, no more, uh, you know, class trips through there or taking the politicians through um, the plants, really, because of the fear of getting COVID within them or another uh, style of disease. They, they've really had to lock themselves in and secure themselves. So I think that's a bit of a loss. Is that, is they really are operating the silo in some cases now again and uh, have lost that, you know, a bit of the luxury of, people being able to go in there or people being able to go into a depot and talk to your field staff about, you know, some issues or problems they had. So that will take a while for us to get back. Uh, we will get it back, though. We'll find a way. And uh, we are re-entering houses and that for water meters and sewage spills and that. It's just a, it's, it's, it's become a little guarded in water, I guess, especially the crews out that are being constantly scrutinized and things like that. Right. Okay. Ron, when you were asked to join the Canada Task Force uh, One Heavy Urban Search and Rescue Team after Hurricane Katrina, that's a while back now, uh, but why were you asked to join? Um, yeah, so uh, they found, uh, and, and again, I didn't respond to Hurricane Katrina, obviously I was picked up shortly after that, but they found when they were down there and they were dealing with the flooding issues from Hurricane Katrina, um, it, it created a whole different uh, um, realm of, of understanding of, of hazards. Um, and it was the hazardous materials that were floating around in the water systems, chemical, treatment, uh, chemical plants that uh, um, now are discharging those chemicals into the, the water sewage from uh, um, sewage system, you know, from uh, wastewater collection systems, as well as from septic systems, septic fields was all rising. Um, animals uh, had no place to go. Many of them uh, succumbed to the, to the flooding. 
um, and, and you have all of that mixed into the water system. And now you're out there saving people off the rooftops of, of homes um, because of these flooding issues. Uh, they found that there was a whole realm of, of uh, they didn't understand you know, what, you know, what, what this water or this wastewater um, could potentially do to harm not only themselves as rescuers, which is obviously the, the number one concern when you're rescuing, is to take care of your rescuers, otherwise there is no rescue, uh, but also um, those that they, they picked up and, and, and uh, a lot of the uh, people they rescued. And, and how do they triage and, and how do we de decontaminate and you know what you know this was beyond their their um, their understanding um, so they they really found they, they needed someone who had that basis of understanding on their team as well plus with all the rescue uh, training so it uh, it definitely opened our eyes for sure and that again lessons learned so what were some of the things that they came across that were very challenging um, it, well, there was a chemical plant that wasn't that far away um, that discharged a lot of chemicals into there, and that was not only was it uh, waterborne, uh, but it was, some of it was airborne uh, or in the air as well. Um, so that was a big challenge. Um, some of the bigger challenges that they actually encountered, not just in the wastewater system, but was the constant flyover of helicopters. Um, it was funny. There was so many people out there trying to assess the problem, but there was hardly anybody on the ground rescuing. So it's really, really, uh, you know, upsetting to to somebody who's, uh, you know, just had their house flooded and they're eight feet of water and they're, they're living on their rooftop and they see helicopter after helicopter after helicopter assess the situation, but they never see anybody rescuing or coming down to rescue them. So for the first, it was longer, the first 48 hours, um, it was constant helicopters flying over and that also hampered the actual rescue efforts because uh, our Vancouver team was, was uh, the first team to arrive uh, on site and, um, and, and actually start rescue. Um, but that's, a, that's another conversation around the FEMA breakdown. But uh, it, it really opened their eyes to, to how distracting that can be when you're trying to conduct a rescue and you're constantly having these you know, distractions uh, uh, around you. But, but we still have to do the And job. I remember, and Greg, you can comment afterwards, but there were some people who were very resistant. I remember you telling me a story. Oh, yes. at, at gunpoint, <laughs> at gun <laughs> in some <point>. cases. <laughs> um, so yeah, they, uh, they were, a lot of people, not residents, did wanted to believe what was happening, understood what was really happening, or you know what was willing to leave their homes. Um, and and at some at gunpoint, they said, well, "I'm not leaving my home here. You know, I'm, this is my home. I'm here to stay." And that's you know, of course, we we you know, city of Vancouver uh, rescue team doesn't come armed. So you know, by all <laughs> means, certainly uh, you know, we just need your name, sir, so we can just keep track of everything. And off they went. Um, there wasn't much they can do for those that didn't want to be rescued. But uh, but yeah, there was there was a lot of it was, it was a lot of people that had no idea that you, you come to the home and most people say, well, can't you just get the city over here to pump the water away? I, I don't think they realized that it wasn't just their neighborhood or their house that was flooded. It was, the, it was nearly the entire, you know, southern state and city um, that was really flooded. There was very few people or very few areas that did not get that flooding. And of course, Louisiana being uh, below the water table, um, you know, or the uh, ocean level is very susceptible to that. And you told me one time about the terrific problem with mold. Oh, yeah, and that was, get back to the airborne too. Um, now, of course, uh, it's been days into the rescue, a few days into the rescue, and mold is starting to, to appear on everything. Um, and, of course, we know as mold spores, once they release, they become dangerous to, to us and atmospheric hazard as well. So, and that was another unknown hazard, and, and they didn't know how to deal with it, and they, they weren't prepared for that. Um, so, and, and that was everywhere, because you have to go inside these homes. You have to be able to clear them. Uh, you know, search and rescue. You have to go in there and say, yes, I've been through every single room. I've been through the attic and everything. Any place where there could possibly be potentially someone has now been, you know, uh, we've gone through it. So they, they were putting themselves right in, in dangerous way without knowing what the danger really truly was. Um, and it was, uh, yeah, a lot of, even years, even years down the road now, you can still interview a, a lot of the, the ones that uh, responded. And, and they all say, you know, they all say very similar things. You know, communication was bad, and, and we had no idea what, you know, what the wastewater condition was like, what, what, or, you know, what kind of bacteria, what kind of viruses, what's going in there. You know, you, you put that onto a pandemic or something like that, you know, it just, it just it makes it even more complex. And, uh, yeah. Greg, you've dealt with an, a number of floods, so yeah, you can probably, probably talk about some of these <laughs> challenges yeah, and how we overcome them. More, more so than me. The, the, uh, uh, some of the communication that you provide for the community itself and, and the people that are there is you know, leave or else this is what's going to happen. But um, a lot of times people just won't, won't leave for whatever reason they have their reasons. And uh, you'll even have the communication there for uh, a group, you know, police officers knocking on doors, firefighters, uh, emergency responders to say, 
we're evacuating this zone, helicopters flying over say need to evacuate, the floods are going to reach a certain level. People still won't do that. Mm -hmm. And Ron mentioned already, part of it is making sure that your responders are safe. And I think in the first 24 hours in 2013 in Calgary, there were almost 500 rescues performed by the Calgary Fire Department because it was the downtown core that was flooding. And people figured up in their condos and 30, 20 story, oh, I'll be fine. It's just the water's down there. OK, but you didn't think about the electricity. You didn't think about uh, you having to walk down those floors, not having any food, um, still getting the water, obviously. But at, at least now things sort of the light bulbs went off. But um, what we've resorted to in some cases is when people flat out refuse and their lives are in danger, it's OK sign this form or write your social insurance number on your arm so we can identify your body. And that will sometimes get them moving a bit faster, <laughs> but not all the time. How's your will? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and you mentioned um, on the opposite side, getting people back. Mm -hmm. So how do we make sure that the, the problems that Ron identified, the mold and all of those things, when do you let people back and how do you handle that? Yeah, it, it, it's, it, I mean, yeah, really long answer potentially to that, but it starts with um, um, recovery. I and mean, one of the things that came out of the BC wildfires, I think in 2005, Kelowna Kamloops, um, uh, the interior any, anyway, was a, uh, a really good model, and Ian has worked on this as well, uh, that became Canada's contribution to an ISO standard on um, uh, having an incident, doing all the pre-planning and training prior, but then the response uh, as well as the recovery occurring um, at the same time. Not, as, not at the same level uh, as the response, but at least that information again and the thought of what does recovery look like, which entails what does our re-entry program look like. Um, having experts in place, I mean, uh, part of having Canada Task Force is getting experts like Ron in there um, because incident managers and emergency managers can manage that crisis, but only with the experts that are there. So identifying we're going to need someone uh, from the water uh, sector, again, electricity, gas, uh, safety codes before anybody can really get into their homes so that it's safe for them to enter to do so. And there are different uh, methodologies as well that you can do quick uh, windshield screening on, on buildings, you know, black, red, green, yellow, orange, where people can go in. But if they're really unsafe, then they can't enter those things. But it's, it goes back to what's your uh, uh, process to identify goals, objective strategies, having those people there, and then coming up with a plan so that reentry is safe for them. Hmm. So let's focus a little bit on the water sector. Um, how have you found in these emergencies, are the utilities, the water utilities, are they prepared for this? Uh, how do they come in? Do they have plans? Um, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, definitely. Uh, um, it really is a matter, though, of um, uh, ensuring the continuity of incident management learning is in place. Because um, you know, Ron may have retired from uh, this, the city of Vancouver, but there's so much knowledge there, we've got to keep that going with the new folks that are moving up, supervisors, leaders, managers. Um, so that whole momentum of, of what has been learned and what worked well as far as training in incident management occurred keeps occurring. So uh, the folks from the water sector, water and wastewater that I've worked with, um, yeah, there's great knowledge on, especially in their area of response, um, and, and just like the gas companies, electric companies, uh, first responders, emergency social services, they're really good at what they do. But when it's a disaster, it's how do we all work together? Yeah. So it's, it, now it comes down to let's have this coordination. Um, I, know, right, I know you're great at what you do, and you're great, and you're great, but we're going to have to prioritize, and we're going to have to um, collaborate so that we have the best possible plan going forward when it occurs. Okay. Yeah. So, Ian, uh, Greg just brought up about the ISO standards that both of you worked on. Can you talk us a, l a little bit about what's in those type of standards and, and uh, what you want to accomplish through those? Uh, yeah, sure. And uh, Greg mentioned it a little bit. Uh, he mentioned about uh, response and recovery and some work we did. And uh, that was actually, uh, it, it was good in the end. It was a little frustrating. We spent... Uh, 
many meetings on a simple graph to uh, show that, a figure to show that concept. And, and what Greg was talking about is uh, it's in order to shorten the duration of event and the impacts of event, it really is about responding quickly and appropriately. And if you can respond quickly and appropriately, you know, you will diminish the long-term effects that that event has had. Uh, to put it in examples of COVID, uh, you know, we all talk about flattening of the curve. You know, we knew we'd go up. There would be, unfortunately, death as well and uh, a lot of sickness. But you could take certain measures that would end that quicker. So, for example, if right away in March when Ontario declared a state of emergency, they also said that day, and everyone will wear a mask for the next month. That really would have shortened uh, the eventual length and the curve would have flattened right away. But that's also something, whether you think is that too drastic of a step. Obviously, masks at the start weren't even recommended, uh, not certainly at the federal level. Uh, and by WHO, they weren't openly recommended, and then they changed that. So um, that's I got a little drifted there. But back to the ISO standards. The ISO standards for crisis management water is built on the same principles as uh, all uh, crisis management plans. Uh, but uh, those particular standards are tailored to the water sector. Uh, so those standards, um, and this is an issue in uh, water and wastewater, is our staff are so used to doing their job, which to others may look like an emergency. A water break isn't an emergency. Uh, it's a day-to-day -day operation uh, for most of our folks. Uh, it's when it gets to a certain size or impacts a certain area or vulnerable customers like a hospital, then it becomes more like an emergency. So the ISO standards we were developing weren't for your business as usual. They were for a crisis. So an event that is beyond your normal means uh, to rectify that event. And uh, they talk about a lot of general principles like, uh, you know, planning, uh, preparation, uh, forming an EOC, uh, forming a response team, uh, communication, how to communicate with the public, uh, the fact that that's, uh, you know, there's so many tools nowadays. Um, and in the water sector, um, a lot of the time, because we're so heavily linked to municipalities, it's not exactly the water folks that are communicating the message. It's you have communications department within the municipality as a whole or in the large corporations, the large water corporations. So the trick there is to work with your communications folks who are great at that, they're great at the social media, but they need the technical aspect from the staff in water and wastewater to give them that information. And some of these standards touch on that, uh, just general principles, and you can get accredited to them if you, if you like. They're not mandatory in Canada nor any of the provinces at this time, uh, but it's something you can work to. And uh, that work is ongoing there. Um, there recently we developed standards for uh, uh, managing displaced populations when it comes to water and wastewater. And Greg did talk about uh, the wildfires and how it is difficult getting uh, uh, people back to their homes and that. It's also equally as difficult. We do it every year in Canada. Uh, a lot of times uh, it's First Nations. Uh, they do have to be, they move an entire small town and they'll move it to a slightly larger town. Well, if you have a town of a thousand and you just dropped in another 600 people, they need water services wastewater services and sanitation services. And uh, we've developed a standard now to look at the water and wastewater aspect of displaced populations. Thank you. Okay. So one of the things, we have some standards, we've got some great standards that you guys have written. How well known are they across Canada and municipalities and what percentage uh, are actually using these? I, I, yeah, I don't know uh, the answer to yeah. that exactly, but I can give you my experience. And with the, uh, I mean, we have about 4,000 municipalities in Canada, and I would say uh, probably 10% are as prepared as they should be. And that goes right from the directors of emergency management. Yeah. Every municipality has infrastructure in it, right? The roads, the water infrastructure. Um, uh, 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 wastewater as well, electricity, gas, right? They've all got or some form of that. Uh, so again, working together to understand when we do have, whether it's a pandemic, whether it's a wildfire, um, practicing that and having some sort of a plan in place. The standards that are available, uh, I mean, great. I mean, we, we've been able to um, 
be part of a very small group that has developed international standards related to crisis in the water sector and then also use them. So we know what is uh, working well. We know what can be uh, changed to make it work better. But it's not just a matter of uh, somebody coming in and saying, oh, hey, we should probably work on this. The standards are great. So it gives you almost a roadmap uh, when you don't have a good idea or a clear direction on how to move forward with business continuity or emergency management or response in the water sector during crisis. So um, they're very useful in, in that way. The, uh, I already mentioned the municipalities. When I look at corporations, um, it's probably the same. I'm, I'm surprised now after retiring from municipal government when I see some of the private industry uh, that I always would have thought are um, on top of this type of stuff because they, you know, bottom line is, is they, they need to produce um, and, and to uh, exist uh, and be financial, financially viable. Uh, to not have uh, a plan or program in place was really surprising to me, and I'm not surprised anymore. Um, and, and most of the ones I see um, ha have not been um, uh, created uh, the best way that they possibly could. So uh, that would be one takeaway, I think, is, is to really look at some of those standards if you need a roadmap going forward, whether it's the, the water sector, but within each, like I say, a, a municipality, uh, some of the private uh, uh, water groups, it's the same thing. Um, uh, don't just uh, have an emergency response plan uh, to check a box. Mm -hmm. um, really understand <laughs> yeah. why it's yeah. there and make sure you integrate all your stakeholders within the municipality. Yeah. 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 So uh, how many have actually even done hazard risk assessments in the, you know, yeah, you know, it, it's hard to, to give uh, a number or percentage, but you're right. I, I'm, I see all the time um, people, here, people will throw a big binder of here's our emergency response plan. And then my first question is, well, show me your hazard assessment. Oh, well, you know, we haven't done that. Or, or we did that 15 years ago. Yeah. Well, that's a long time ago. Uh, you can't have an emergency response plan without having an idea about your hazard uh, impacts and your business uh, analysis. Like now you've got the hazard and emergency response, but what's that impact to your business? So that's why the emergency management and business continuity go hand in hand, because you're going to have that response to the emergency, which is the hazard, and then you're going to have some sort of drop in, in business, um, uh, business operations. So what does that look like? Where are your choke points? And um, then that all goes to you've got the plans. Now we've got to practice them again. But yeah, yeah it, it's, 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 uh, it's glaring. Um, um, uh, municipally and uh, even in industry that uh, a lot of the work hasn't been done. And I think we'll see that with the pandemic now, uh, just look at how hard hit a lot of businesses uh, have been yeah. and which ones are um, s surviving and, and doing well and the ones that just aren't uh, going to make it. Yeah, it's interesting because this whole session is part of the leadership and I think that that's one of the things that this comes under is actual leadership. I remember one of the um, city managers of one of the largest municipalities in Canada saying to me, Val, I've got so many managers, where are my leaders? And I think that one of the things is that so many, and Ian, uh, any of you can jump in here, but we see people are so busy dealing with day-to-day -day paperwork, day-to-day -day operations that the leaders are not coming forward to take a look at how do I take my municipality, how do I take my utility at that le at into the next level by looking at what I should be doing and delegating some of the other things to people who I trust. Um, so Ron, you're in education. Ian, um, maybe start with Ron. How do we get that message across that we've got to start showing leadership and preparing for these emergencies and the more strategic level yeah. of managing um yeah that's a challenging one but uh really comes down to and uh, from my opinion is that you need a champion somewhere um mm -hmm. somebody it's not just about understanding and knowing it it's not just about learning it it's not just about the educational piece but it's somebody who's got a passion to take that to the next level um we have many people that, that we have in place that are that are running these systems and managing systems but there's no Nobody sticks out and says, you know what, I have a real passion for this. I have a real drive for this. We, I'm going to lead this. I'm going to take this to the next level because that's usually what it takes. Um, <clears throat> and once you take it to the next level, 
other people follow. Um, you know, once you have a, a good, solid leader in place, um, it's it's amazing how how more exciting it is for everyone else to get to follow someone who's got that passion and can see that passion and 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 feed off of it. Um, once you have that in place, things start to to really start to move because there's a lot of things that you don't generally think about um, when it comes to our day to day jobs. Um, you know, all of us here, I would I would definitely consider is to be you be in that in that area. We're passionate about what we do. Yeah. Um, you know, we want to. Well, all of us are. Like you know, all all four of us and, and many of us here that you're even speaking within this conference, we're passionate about what we do. That's why we're here. That's why we volunteer our time. That's why we want to make an effort because we want to see that go to the next step. You know, we want to take that that beyond management, beyond just the knowledge, but really take it to the next step. Ian, can you add to that? Yeah, I can actually. I think the thing is in in the water and the wastewater sector, particularly water, is we're so heavy, heavily regulated, uh, particularly in Ontario is a good example. I mean, uh, we did, unfortunately, we had Walkerton and that brought about a great regulatory change in water uh, across Canada, but particularly in Ontario. Uh, it's kind of like the COVID event will for long-term care. You'll see drastic changes in the regulations surrounding that. It becomes a case of we're so spend much of our time, so much of our time on the regulatory matters that it's tough for the leaders to step up and to sell and pitch going beyond on that. Standards are a great tool. Um, standards set out a certain level of doing a task where it, it's recognized internationally or nationally that you are meeting those objectives and those standards. So if you get good leaders, and unfortunately I worked uh, below a gentleman, Bernie Kaslikas, who years ago before Walkerton um, proposed that Durham Region uh, implement ISO 9000 and HACCP in its water system. And they actually did, uh, that was my first job when I was consulting, they became the first municipality in North America to have ISO 9000, ISO 14000 and HACCP in a municipal water supply. Uh, to me, that's leadership because eventually, and it was through the tragedy of Walkerton, and then Ontario now has the drinking water quality management system, which is based on those three standards. But in the meantime, municipalities really have to champion certain things uh, within their, you know, within their daily services, and not wait for a regulation. We have to, you know, we have to get away from being reactive and be proactive. And there are great mines in water and wastewater across Canada. We're well known. And uh, it really what unfortunately is going to hamper us now is the economic impacts of COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they talk about a lot of industries being greatly financially impacted, but municipalities were heavily impacted through the drop in water sales and also our transit. So that is going to play a role too in you know developing leaders going forward. It's the cost-effective solutions, and often standards or other tools are out there uh, to help you go in that right direction and really come up with something that's you know a high level of quality for your water and wastewater while being economically reasonable and meeting the challenges. Okay. Greg. Um Frustrating having developed the standards and seeing all the things that can be done, and yet you said maybe 10% of people are really disaster ready. Mm -hmm. So if you could wave your magic wand, what would you, you know if you, you know you were running a municipality? What would you do? Yeah, <laughs> I've been asked that before. So I, I think the, the magic wand side of it. If I could start a corporation or start a building a city. Uh, and what that organizational structure looks like, I, I would have that director of emergency management um, right at the close, uh, close to the, the the CEO or the city manager, um, because if there's the understand, because then you have that support on the leadership side. So I, it's tried, the champion. Yeah, that Rob's exactly. Talking about. That champion and that leadership, because I've tried to implement programs from a. Well, basically from a lower level, business unit wise or whatever it may be, and to push that uphill um, is really, really tough. You've got to have that understanding and that champion at the highest level. And um, uh, really, I think uh, what we see is um, uh, that, that whole uh, leadership aspect uh, um, being there. Uh, otherwise, when you have that structure somewhere else, it's, it's tough to get it going. Mm. Okay. So this morning, the keynote speaker uh, talked about 
the two things. You can see things as the challenges, but there's also an opportunity there. So does COVID give us an opportunity that people are sort of perhaps sitting up and taking a, you know, notice now? Uh, we've talked about the economic impact. <laughs> Yeah. You're skeptical. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I hope so. Um, it, it's, you know, it, it, it's a tough uh, uh, phrase uh, in, in the, the crisis world uh, where um, you never want a, a disaster to go to waste. And, and <laughs> that meaning the preparedness side of it again. Yeah. So ha you've got a small window to, to, um, uh, to have the right people's attention. Um, at that higher level again, so that, okay, we had a flood or we had that big fire. Wow, that really cost us a lot of money or lives or property, whatever it is. What's that one point that really sticks out for them? And then you have that opportunity to move forward. Um, and, and right now, we've got this opportunity with, the, uh, um, with COVID and the pandemic right now to really take a much uh, better look at emergency management and business continuity. So I already mentioned like 40% of businesses will not recover from any disaster, whether it's a fire, a flood, a pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, so we know that's going to happen. That's been out there for, for 20 years or more, uh, just from all the disasters that we've seen. Um, and, and the other thing that we've seen is that uh, all the work that's done pre-disaster, uh, pre-emergency, uh, from the financial perspective, I mean, there's a seven to one ratio where uh, the, the dollars you spend on it, uh, you're going to save um, on the other side of it. So um, if that's the driver, then that's something that should be uh, identified and at least worked upon as well. But um, the awareness is there, and it shouldn't just be about COVID right now. It needs to be about the broader business continuity, whether it's a loss of workforce because of a pandemic or something else, whether it's a loss of uh, workplace or loss of asset due to something or something else, what does that mean to your municipality or what does that mean to your business? Okay, so we talked, uh, I think one you mentioned that you know we're Canadian, we don't like to do the enforcement so, so much, but is that what it takes? I mean, we talked about Walkerton that changed the certification of operators, there was regulations there. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, there are some that will be altruistic and go along, our 10% that are say, yeah, this is really good. But we now have, uh, in, uh, you're talking about some regulations in, in Ontario, you have to have an asset management plan. You're starting to do the emergency hazard risk assessments. Do we need government regulations to say, thou shalt? Yeah. <laughs> oh, you want me? Uh, um, yeah, you, 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 you got to have that structure in place regardless. Um, you know, but you still need that champion to, to bring it forward. Um, I, I'll take it, uh, you know, everyone can relate to this. Uh, take a look at what has happened with our pandemic right here in the province of BC compared to other jurisdictions. Um, you know, we, we had the same stuff in place. Um, uh, our leader, uh, which I'm going to say is Dr. Uh, Dr. Henry, um, has really gone to, you know, she's taken the stance uh, uh, that, you know, we're, we don't want to enforce this. We don't want to do that. What we want to do is we want to encourage people. We want to teach people. We want to get them to understand and then move forward with it. And then as uh, over time, it'll become something that becomes the new norm. And then if we have no other choice, then we have to enforce. Yeah. Um, but we still have to have those enforcements in place. We still have yeah. to have those law rules and regulations to say, you know, thou shall not do this. But you need that one person to championship and push ahead of it and say, yes, this is the reason why. Follow me and you will be compliant. I think it's great to have a carrot, but <laughs> would people have stopped drinking and driving had we not had very, very stringent laws? Would we have put seatbelts right. on if there had not been regulations? So, yeah. you know, Ian, you said there's a lot yeah. of regulations yeah, in Ontario. What's your feelings on this? Should we be mandating some of these responses and the compliance to some of these standards? I, I think you need a, and I'm kind of biased, my, my day job is compliance manager, so I read regulations all day. But um, you need a combination, and and sometimes the preferred method is if you can do it without a regulation, that is the way to do it. Uh, you yep. can take the principles, and, and that's kind of what standards are. They're they're not necessarily a regulation, but it's the principles behind the objectives, like how to get there. Um, but if that's not working, then yes, you need regulations because 
it's such a varied playing field across all of Canada. Greg mentioned uh, mm -hmm. uh, over 4,000 uh, uh, municipalities. And in Ontario, we have over 600 water systems, individual water systems run in the most part by individual municipalities. And if you don't set a regulation at a very clear level playing field on what needs to be achieved, then sometimes you, you, you just simply can't achieve it and the, the regulations are necessary. And then also too, as the public and private sector both do water, it, it has to be the same for both. Uh, and really from a health and safety perspective, uh, it should be no difference if I'm living in Vancouver or living in Toronto or living in the Yukon. Uh, you really want the quality of the water to be there. And, and unfortunately, uh, in order to achieve that, you do need regulations to keep some places on. So. Greg? Yeah, I, I think we're all kind of on the same page. And, and um, actually, I, I've got a bit of an analogy for your, your seat belts and drinking and driving one too. But um, anytime we're doing uh, crisis leadership training, uh, one of the questions that come up is because you have different entities and agencies and, well, who's in charge then? Well, uh, because it, there's provincial legislation, there's municipal legislation, federal legislation. Um, if you have to start bringing out the, the hammer of legislation, y you've lost a certain amount of coordination um, and cooperation for the most part. Um, all these different agencies, municipalities or provinces, uh, the, the uh, regulators, it, we all have to work together for the betterment of what's occurring. If we can all agree on what our goals are, um, then we're going to get there without hammering out something and saying, well, hey, I, I'm the one that should be in charge because I've got this piece of legislation, um, which all goes back to our exercising and, and pre-planning and, and all that anyway, to have those conversations. So um, yeah, you have to have it, but it's more about, and, and I, honestly, uh, working in the US and Canada, I, I do think it's a Canadian cultural thing where we can have the conversations mm -hmm. and we can cooperate more uh, for the greater good. So I'd like to see that. And then we still do have the legislation in place or the, um, the regulations. Uh, the, the, just thinking about the uh, you know, drinking and driving and having seat belts and, and having that in place um, you're right, that's, an, you know, that's there for the, for the greater good, but I look at my kids and um, I don't think they care as much about uh, what the fine or the ticket may be as much as they won't go out without having a designated driver. Mm -hmm. And it's not because of getting stopped and getting caught, it's because of the consequences that they're now aware of and, and been made aware yes. of. And I think just like COVID, the more we're all aware of what's happening, uh, we'll all make the right decisions. So and I think a generational yeah. thing as well. I, it reminds me of the story of the fellow that was driving with his young daughter um, and son in the car and they went past another car and there's a naked woman in the car. And the daddy said, the child said, look, look, daddy, that lady isn't wearing a seatbelt. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we instill these things in, into each other. Um, and that's where we need to get to with some of these things right. in, the, in the industry. So you had, Ian had mentioned before, and I know you're going to be doing a lot of talk on it, and I don't want to take away from your talk, your keynote address tomorrow. So everybody needs to come in on this because it's going to be a fantastic keynote address tomorrow. But you have mentioned incident command. And you're a level four, you're a FEMA registered, you're, you've taught at Harvard, you've done a heck of a lot. Ron, you're a level two FEMA, I believe, um, disaster response. So tell us how Canada needs to do better on incident command systems. <laughs> um, uh, ca Canada's uh, different than the United States uh, uh, f for a lot of reasons. Uh, um, uh, but w one of the things is you know, a lot of what happens in the U.S. impacts Canada. And, and just speaking on the emergency management side, um, we, wow, I, it'd take a long time to talk <laughs> yeah, about this. Yeah, <laughs> but, but, uh, Tune in tomorrow. <laughs> okay, well, I, I don't know. I'll talk about it tomorrow. But the, uh, you hear about the incident command system, which in the 70s started in the U.S. because of the devastation of the wildfires. But in the 50s, Canada had uh, our system in place, our incident management system in place, because of the Cold War uh, and we wanted to have a coordinated response. And a lot of the uh, processes and methodologies that were successful in Canada became a part of the incident command system as well. So um, uh, incident command system, incident management systems are uh, not even regulated in each province. They're strongly suggested 
uh, that you have an incident management system, um, but it doesn't have to be the incident command system. There's gold, silver, bronze, there's other systems out there. But uh, the, most legislation in each province on the uh, emergency management legislation talks about having a system in place. Um, we hear about the incident command system more than anything else because of the United States. Um, and that's how we're influenced. And it's very good. Um, uh, but again, culturally, I mean, we're, we're, we're not the US and we're Canadians. So the best parts of ICS is, is uh, I think, really focused upon here in Canada. And it goes back to those processes and that collaboration and coordination and the structure uh, that's in place. But when you go from province to province, and even from regulator to regulator, um, oil and gas in BC has regulated ICS as the incident management system. I don't know about the environmental or the water side. Uh, the province, uh, I believe, after the wildfires um, instituted that uh, as well. Ron, you'd know better. Um, as we move across, Alberta says have an incident management system. Saskatchewan. Uh, well, it does whatever Alberta does. So they said the same thing. Manitoba is caught between IMS and ICS. Ontario has their system in place, um, uh, but also uses ICS to some extent, and it's a blend. Uh, I, I believe uh, Quebec has their own system as well, but they rely on the old uh, Canadian system. And then the uh, maritime provinces are, are different as well. But the idea is that you have something in place that is easily and readily available um, to integrate into any type of federal response that may be requested or needed. Right. Yep. Uh, <laughs> Greg has been doing incident command training as part of Operators Without Borders, and there's been such a tremendous take up in the yep. Caribbean. Yep. We sold out, well, sold out, um, <laughs> maxed, <laughs> there was out. A, maxed out at 100 <laughs> people in the first session. We did a, a one for an independent water utility, and then we just did another 72 uh, <laughs> last week. Are we getting that sort of uptake in Canada? for the training? Yes, definitely. Um, yeah, and I'll leave it at that, but uh, each province uh, um, has their um, uh, trainers in place. Mm -hmm. The authorities having jurisdictions have recognized the incident command system as uh, one of the incident management systems to use, and the uptake is, is definitely um, um, moving forward at a better rate. Yeah. Okay. so. I'm just going to ask one last question, then we'll move into questions from any of the participants. Two of you had mentioned supply chain. Ian, you had talked about the su supply chain issues. Um, how do you, Greg, just staying with you for a minute, how do you foresee additional supply chain um, issues related to COVID? I, I think uh, I, I was more concerned back in February and, and March um, uh, because I had done um, um, well, a good deal of work on pandemic planning, but also <clears throat> at the critical infrastructure level with the uh, federal government. Mm -hmm. and, and we had, again, exercised uh, some of the plans that were in place there where it looked at uh, what is needed between the water sector to the health sector, um, the energy sector, uh, when we would happen to have a pandemic and the reliance upon all those different sectors and their interdependencies. Um, so I, I, I was concerned, especially when I saw borders closing and um, you know everybody staying at home and, and well, how are we going to get all those different supplies? Uh, what companies or municipalities had done some pandemic planning and had their own stockpile in place or had thought about working from home, mm -hmm. the SCADA terminals, um, um, the operators that were so important, uh, had they practiced that before all this? And I know Ian and Ron can speak to it, but there were struggles in some areas um, of the water and wastewater sector with some groups that hadn't done all that. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's just one area, but when I looked at uh, the borders closing and uh, understanding the, the timing and the impact on each different sector as we move through a disaster, um, I, you know, talking to some colleagues and saying, well, there's going to be a, a run on food because uh, of what comes in through the United States. Toilet and paper? A short, yeah, right. <laughs> and, and, and that was, you know, a rumor that, you know, of course, we didn't foresee the toilet paper one coming, but uh, um, <laughs> it was uh, some of the food and, and seeing on the shelves because people would hoard, but not only the hoarding, it's trying to keep up with that. So going forward, I think we've been through that wave. I don't think there's as much worry from community uh, as well as the concern from the different sectors. 
we've, you know, flattening the curve doesn't just mean uh, us uh, staying healthy. It means uh, understanding the, because there's the other impacts that everything else is still happening. We're, we're still going to have flu season. We're still going to have um, different people for different sicknesses and illnesses having to go to a hospital. Everything has to continue, but it's going to be a little bumpy, but we've moved through that stage and the supply chain, it, it won't be as much as an issue, I don't think. Okay. Ian, you had mentioned supply chain when you first started. Yeah, I I might disagree with Greg on this, so I don't often do that. But uh, for me, I mean, Greg's quite right in the fact that it, it is a little more under control. But for the water sector, it really is the wild card out there still. That, uh, I mean, you can control what happens in the confines of your plant, your distribution system, your cells. But... The supply chain, you're relying on someone else. And no matter how strong your contract is, it's just facts of life that things get in the way. And uh, one particular area that scares me a little bit is chemical supply, and particularly chemicals who, in order to make them, some of the products come from the states or have to cross from the states. And uh, we did see that early on the pandemic, uh, for example, with uh, ferrous chloride, ferrous chloride, uh, obviously used in uh, in wastewater for settling and for phosphorus removal as a coagulant, um, but it's it's a byproduct of the steel industry. It's it's a waste from the steel industry, pickle liquid that we use at our wastewater plant. Well, that's as the steel mill shut down from the economic impact, um, that started to dry up, and plants had to go to the more expensive uh, man-made ferric chloride or alum. So there is a little worries with that still that. Uh, we're starting to see higher numbers. I know Ontario right now, unfortunately, we're back in the 300s. Uh, we may have dropped below today. I haven't seen the numbers yet today. But uh, that impact could be at one of your suppliers or could be based out of the U.S. So I still think we're getting better at it. And particularly in my experience on this, I'm sure the other problems are the same. But in Ontario, uh, uh, Mr. Ford, our premier, has a real push for local suppliers and they've done a good job of that a lot of the large factories have retooled a lot of the automotive places and they're making things like ventilator masks um so really building up a local supply so we can get away from those interdependencies but in the areas of water treatment and wastewater chemicals that's not really in the limelight so people aren't doing it so for me i'm still a little concerned about it yeah. okay thank you so um, I'm not sure how um, on the questions, Peter, do we have some questions? Oh, yes, we have lots of questions. Oh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, you've got three fantastic, <laughs> passionate champions here. Excellent. So um, there have been, they've been a lot of questions um, around... Uh, formats, uh, I don't even know where to start, but there, there are definitely some themes. First of all, thanks guys, that was a great panel discussion and judging by the questions, a lot of interest. So one of the themes of some of the questions have been around templates or formats for emergency response plans. Um, and before I sort of put the question over, let me just add one or two caveats so you can maybe deal with it at the same time. So, uh, so that's the first question and part of that is are there formats for the small systems and the large systems? Do they differ? Is there an ISO component to that? And how often should these be updated? So maybe you can deal with that first group of questions all okay. kind of together around mm -hmm. formats, templates, templates for small systems, large systems. I'll have Greg start yeah. off with that. Well, <laughs> yeah, I'll suggest that too. So the short answer, and I'll have to expand upon it, and these two can as well, but yes. <laughs> so th there definitely are the templates uh, and the formats that are in place, the large versus small. And in fact, we, we spent a lot of time on the one uh, crisis management of water utilities, ISO standard, developing it so it was for large or small. Um, th the difference comes into, and, and same with the other standards that are out there, the CSA 1600 standard on uh, emergency management and business continuity. Um, they're built, um, whether you're a, a larger entity versus a smaller entity, mm -hmm. you just have less things to put in there. Um, you still need to follow the, um, that template and the information that's there. It's there for a reason. Um, and the standards uh, and the elements of the standards are there for a reason. Um, but for a larger entity or, or area, you might have a, 
a page of explanation versus a couple sentences. So um, <clears throat> they're built for, for just that. Yeah. Ian, do you want to add to that from running a utility point of view? Yeah, it's, uh, it's very similar to what Greg said. Uh, there are templates and there are uh, standards that give directions on things you should cover. And they are meant to be applicable for all sizes of utilities. Mm -hmm. And uh, kind of along the same theme, a good example, and Greg might touch on it tomorrow or, or later today, is uh, with the instant command system. It's, it's very similar. It's applicable to all sizes. And, uh, you know, it's, it's designed to have a certain number of people fill positions in the EOC and you draw them in as needed. So, for example, if it's not something to do with finances and purchasing, you have a seat there for them, but you might not use them. Uh, COVID, obviously, uh, your response team would be, you know, more health people in there than per usual, things like that. But the idea is it's the principles behind uh, emergency management and planning and preparation that should be looked at. And those are applicable anywhere, any location, any size. Uh, so that's what the takeaway from that. Yeah. Thank you. Ron? Yeah, and I'll just quickly add to that too. Um, yes, definitely um, look at the templates, see what's available. You know, like Mercy Management PC, there's, as, uh, there's lots of information there that can be found. Um, but don't forget too is the networking piece. And, and that's your neighbor. Uh, who's, who's next door to your neighbor? Who's the next district over? Who's the next city over there? What have they done? How are they able to help you as well? Um, because you find that a lot of the resources have already been done um, and a lot of us are willing to share uh, those resources. So don't, don't forget your neighbors, don't forget your network system. Yeah. Okay, Peter, next question. Great. Um, next question is, a lot, I, I think you've already answered, but I want to hear it from you or they want to hear it from you, is are there different standards for different disasters or is there a, like an emergency response plan? Does, it, does one size fit all, in, whether it's a, an earthquake a water main break, uh, an oil spill in a water system, et cetera. Greg, do you want to start off again? Well, the, the, the standards itself that are emergency management, business continuity standards, I would say yes, uh, would fit w what you need. Um, but there's so much that comes into that. Um, and, and yes, you, you can and maybe should have specific emergency response plans for the hazards that have been identified like here you need earthquake yeah, plans, yeah. Uh, flood plans in Calgary, hurricane plans on the East Coast. Um, and you don't need that in other areas, wildfire management plans. So you, that comes, the specific plan, uh, plans come from the uh, specific hazard identification. Um, but a lot of uh, what I've learned now is um, the one, the few things that, are, and I won't get them all right now, that are needed every uh, major emergency or disaster is you have to have a communication plan, you have to have an evacuation plan, you have to have a debris management plan, no matter what. Um, no matter what that hazard plan may be, those are the uh, uh, supporting plans that always have to be in place. So what does that look like um, for any type of uh, impact you may have? Yep. Ian, do you want to add? Yeah, and I think that's a great intro for me, uh, Greg. He nailed it right there. You want a plan that's not so specific. Um, you don't want to give an operator, you know, 10 different plans to remember for evacuation types. You just want an evacuation plan. And I don't need to know that I'm evacuating because there's a flood coming, there's a tornado coming, uh, there's a chlorine gas leak. I just have to know to execute that evacuation component. So as much as you can, it, it, it's good to have general plans and then you much of your work instruction that's very specific to a type of emergency or sometimes is dictated by regulations. Mm -hmm. But in general, you do want those, you know, the ones Greg talked about, a debris management plan, an evacuation plan, a shelter in place plan, and a, a, a water, an alternate water and wastewater services plan. Uh, those are the ones you should have. And if you can have those, you can adapt them for most emergencies. Uh, they're most emergencies are just slightly different in causes, but the actions you take are are very similar. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, Ron. And, and uh, quickly to add to that too is uh, also, um, don't forget that uh, when it comes to these plans for the higher end, they're all gonna be very similar, but when it comes right down to what type of, of incident or what type of hazard that you're trying to work around, whether it be earthquake or flooding, 
that's where operational wise you need a separate plan completely uh, because you're going to react completely different to a tsunami than you would you know say a volcanic uh, eruption I, you know totally most yeah. people don't you know, don't forget that Baker is live um, so th those are still possibilities but that's where the plan operational wise logistics that's where the ICS command system really comes into the logistics of it yeah. that's where it really changes so the like the emergency response plans that I've written um, are basically there's floods there's hurricane there's individual plans and they're actually by department and they are post-disaster where you know that something's coming. Um, we do, in Caribbean, we did a lot of hurricanes. Um, there is during the disaster and then what are the steps afterwards. So there's a three-step process in every specific plan. But then you've got your overall command incident uh, structure as well. Okay, the next question is based on, um, I guess, a comment was made that, I think you said, Greg, only 10% of municipalities are really ready for this. Is that what you said? Yeah. Uh, operators sometimes feel they're, in terms of, of without the, the champion you talked about, they're kind of low on the totem pole in terms of the big picture. And as we know, their heads are down and they're busy doing day-to-day -day things. What can they do to advance such a plan if they're in one of that 90% municipality um, to, really, to really get some traction and make this happen and obviously protect themselves? Yeah, what I've found some success in is um, uh, find that person who's as interested as you that might be outside of water. Maybe they're in the police department or fire department or they're working for the gas utility or, or the health sector. There's, there's someone like you out there somewhere, even if it's not uh, going as far as you'd want uh, up the chain to, to help out your area. Because when it comes down to it, you're, if it's a big enough event like this or, or others, you're going to have to be working with those other sectors or those other stakeholders. So uh, that helps a lot, is finding your mutual, um, uh, I guess, champion in some of the other sectors. Mm -hmm. Because eventually, uh, you're going to find someone who's got that leadership support, and it's going to come across this way. Yep. Ian? Yeah, actually, uh, that's a question, and Greg's answer kind of really. Uh, you're cutting out, Ian, so I'll, I'll go to Ron. Um, Is yeah. anything to add? So ex exactly what Greg said, I just elaborate the same thing. Um, yeah, just look for that champion within your, your work area, exactly. but just possibly uh, in a different career. department. Uh, okay. oh, are, are you back, back Ian? <laughs> uh, well, let's see. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was just saying that uh, Greg's answer was a, a very good one because it almost describes his career. Um, <laughs> basically, Greg was fireman. Yeah. No, no, but it, it's a good, yeah. it's a very good answer because uh, Greg initially, uh, I'm not sure if he mentioned in his intro, was uh, he started as a fireman uh, in fire services in Calgary, and then yeah, actually, question and Greg's answer kind of really mimics oh. Greg quite well. Uh, well, let's. Greg's answer was a, a very good one. Basically, Greg was the fire. Uh, oh. Greg initially uh, in fire services in Calgary. That switch was he was a leader. They know the job, they know what they need, and they have to listen and communicate to each other. And then you will. You will get a champion who will say, you know, okay, I'm going to write this system, but I really need an expert in the field. And that's the operator. And it's only a good plan if both of them at, at at each level, get together and really agree upon, communicate, and then train on that plan. Do you have in uh, in Durham region? Do you have an emergency response committee that would have operators, uh, you know, uh, to the question that would sit on that? Uh, what we have in that fashion is that we have uh, we're ISO certified uh, at our largest wastewater facility, Dufferin Creek. Um, we are ISO 14,000, and uh, we also, on the water side in Ontario, we have the Drinking Water Quality Management Center. That is very operator interactive. Uh, they are the internal auditors. Uh, we use the operators because they know the job the best. The water operators will uh, audit the wastewater and vice versa. Uh, so that's our model, and uh, we, we try to always get the operators involved, and, and also outside of emergency management. Uh, on our capital projects, uh, on things like that. Uh, uh, it's just generally a, a good sound business practice to get all levels involved, especially when it comes to emergency management. 
And I think, Ron, that yeah. is your background a little bit, because you were with the city of Vancouver, and you got an interest in this. And Yeah, and then that probably describes my career, too, just much like Greg. <laughs> so, um, you know, once you find the, those people that are passionate, attach yourself to them. Uh, and then and then together, you know, you guys are a bigger voice, and then it continues on. Um, but when you do find that champion, that champion's got to be at a higher level. It's got to be at that senior management director level. Um, that's the champion you're really going to need to to push change. Mm -hmm. Because from the bottom, as you know, you can do all the training, you can do everything you want, but if it's not, if there's no buy-in from the top end, you're not going to get, you're not going to get the traction you're looking for. Okay. Okay. Next question is, uh, how often should these plans be updated? <laughs> um, I'm going to quickly answer that one. Um, uh, is, uh, I always say is, don't forget geographically what happened. Um, have our hospitals changed? Has our schools changed? Has our public works department moved to a different location? These are the reasonings that you want to look at is, is the time to change things. Or um, has the whole staff who built this emergency plan five years ago still around? Uh, is there enough people that understand the plan? You know, if not, well, then we really need to take a look at this and reinvest in that. But you, you want to, do you want to pull that plan out? I would say, and then this is my personal opinion, annually, dust it off, and then make sure everyone's on the same page. It could be, you know, simply let's just go over this plan. Let's just make sure that we all in agreement. We all understand what our responsibilities are, and then we can, you know, address it another time. And 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 um, that needs to be written in the plan. So there's a training component, <laughs> and yeah, right. Yeah. So so whatever you've identified, whether it's a, a massive change in, in staff, um, after any exercise, like if it's once a year you exercise, then you've definitely found something in there that needs to be changed. Yep. It might even just be a phone number, or email, um, and also uh, after any event. So those were at least the three things that I would put in there of of when to. Uh, look at changing your plan. I'm going to yeah. ask a follow up to that is how do you store your plan? Because um, it's great to have everybody trained and they know exactly what to do. But usually there's a documented plan. If all the electricity goes down and it's only electronic. So what's your recommendations on how we actually keep those plans and where they are? Yeah, I, I'm I always because it's happened to me, right? With all the technology we have, sometimes it just doesn't work or you lose yeah. electricity. Mm -hmm. So you have to have whatever the number is of paper copies somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, and even having somebody having it locally uh, on, on a laptop or a thumb drive. And then you have it on the more widely uh, accessed uh, intranet for yeah. an organization. Yeah, because yeah. that's, that's yeah. an important point, because people need to be able to get yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. And you'll find another that. question? Yes, uh, two questions. One is uh, a couple of people have asked for you to share some of your your links and your your resources and your plans is that something that you can do afterwards like Valerie your stuff and we to, could do to through, a point, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah through the EOCP yeah. okay mm -hmm. I mean I should mention that this is how Greg makes his living like Adam yeah. was saying on the keynote address this morning hey you know if you need personal coaching here I am we well, um, well, even making that information available so people right. can reach is, out to you and, yeah, and, yeah they should reach oh, out yeah. because yeah. this is the guy who is phenomenal he's working with yeah. uh, indigenous communities has worked with many municipalities and not only that, it's not just theory. He's been there and done it. So please reach out to Greg. Right. Yeah. So what we'll do is, is uh, as part of the follow up the conference, we'll make that information available, and people can reach out to you in, in a, and, and avail themselves of your services. Well, I mean, and Ian uh, has a you know standards and has a I know has been very very generous in the things that he has shared, and will you know pick up the phone sometimes if you've got a question and ask. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so here's a question which is quite a shift from the theme, or not the, the, the theme, but from the, the recent questions, and it's a good question. Uh, Greg made the comment that we have normalized 3,000 deaths a year on the flu in Canada annually. Uh, does he think that COVID deaths could be normalized in such a way as well? Or um, is the thought on the panel that it should be treated more like the polio deaths will be tried, if polio vaccine will be tried to eradicate it completely? Right. Um, I, I, so I don't know enough about the virology. I, I, I speak to people in the industry and, and see what's coming, and we've heard about some of the vaccines that might be coming out. Uh, but, I mean, COVID is one of seven coronaviruses. I won't get into all that right now. And, and like the flu, we're always using last year's flu strain for the um, vaccine. Year's um, and we know we need at least 75% of a population to get herd immunity even. Uh, but as experts are saying, it's, it's not a flu, and we can't, we can't do all that right now anyway. So, uh, I mean, just my opinion from listening to all those experts, 
Yeah, we're going to have to live with this now. And right now means it, it's 10,000 a year. It's, the, it's all the rules that we're, we're trying to work within. And uh, it, I, I don't see it going away anytime soon. Um, we will be living with it and, and having to work within the parameters of it. Yeah, that's a, that's a good response. Uh, because I, I, I probably say the same thing. I mean, it's, I, I'm no medical expert, so I can't really speak to that aspect either, but I, I yeah, exactly what Greg has said. Um, normalized, yeah, there's, no, there's no shot for the common cold. Um, but however, for flu, we have immunizations, you know, depending on, on what we can do. Okay, great guys, we're at, uh, we're at 12 o'clock, so I just wanna thank, uh, thank you, Valerie, for, uh, for sort of hosting this, and for Ron, Greg, and Ian, for you joining. Um, you guys just got one more final comment. Uh, yeah, I was going closing, to ask and each we'll person to, <laughs> yeah. what's the one big takeaway each of you would like to impart to the listeners? One big takeaway. Uh, I guess I'll start. Um, the big takeaway uh, for me is uh, build your plan, or big boy is build your plan, but, but really take consideration communication as being what I see the number one issue in almost everything that I see when it comes to problems, issues, disaster responses that didn't work all that well. Um, and make sure you have a B and C plan and practice. B and a C plan. Ian, your big takeaway. Sure. I would say, and it came up today, is really reach out to your neighboring municipalities, your contacts in the industry, events like this, because someone's done it before. And even though we are in different times in each province and town for where we're at with the pandemic, the actions taken are the same. And, and really, you don't have to invent it. You know, we can take from Europe, who went through it first, to South America, to us, and also give back to, if you're asked by outside agencies, we do a lot of work with the Caribbean. If they ask questions, we help them out. So really get your networks up and start working together on this. It truly is a worldwide situation. I'd say uh, uh, take the leadership uh, side of this, meaning um, w whether it's a disaster that we've talked about, fires and floods, and, and uh, uh, look to your experts. So uh, an expert from the water sector if you need them. And right now, because of this disaster, look to your health experts mm. and uh, do what they're saying and provide that leadership for whether it's your staff, um, people you're working with, working for, and, and really show that aspect of it. So I hope that you have enjoyed this panel session. We didn't want to stand up and give four PowerPoint presentations. Uh, we wanted more of a fireside chat that people could engage in and uh, have a conversation. So we hope that the conversation has been really useful and we're not going anywhere in the next while. So please uh, contact us if you have questions or we can help in any way. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much, everybody.